Okay, so we're on the bottom of page 23, the Mishnah that begins by the number 19, right, by the line that says 19 next to it, which is Zivchei Shalmei Tzibur, Vashomis. This is our third class on this Mishnayis alone. And I'm not going to repeat last week's class and the repetition from two weeks ago's class. I'm going to try to jump straight in. We're learning about a Korban Osham. In Rabbi Mangel's English translation of Korban Osham, he calls it a guilt offering. He calls it a guilt offering because he cannot call it a sin offering because the Chatas is called a sin offering. Even though really Chatas means sin and Osham means sin, but in English, you got to come up with two different words. So chatas means sin, and asham means guilt, even though they both mean guilt and they both mean sin. Mystically, however, Kabbalistically, spiritually, there's a huge difference between the two karbanas. As I explained to you, the asham is male and the chatas is female. What does that mean? It means that chatas is correcting a wrong and asham is reinforcing a right. That's how you understand it. There's a lower level and a higher level. Meaning, as I've told you a bunch of times, when I do something wrong, anytime I do something wrong, I've done two wrongs. A, I made a mistake. And B, I made the mistake because I stopped paying attention. Right? I gave you the simple example. You have relationships. Relationships. Whatever relationships you have. Relationships with friends. When do you make a mistake and hurt a friend? When you stop thinking about that friendship. So every sin is automatically a double sin. Anything I do wrong is I did something wrong, and I did something wrong because I lost my cognizance. I lost my attention. So normally when you do an Aveda, you're being a Korban Chatas. Chatas means fix the wrong. And according to the Chazal, after you bring the Chatas, you'd bring an oila. And the purpose of the oila that comes after the Chatas is after I fix the wrong, I strengthen the right. Which means to to renew my attention giving to that friend of mine. And in this case, of course, it's our relationship with Hashem. We're to say it in Kabbalah language, Chatos is like Tshuva Tata, and Oil is like Tshuva Elo. Asham is, I did an Aveda, I did an Aveda, and there's no Chatos. I made a mistake, I did something wrong, but I'm not fixing the wrong. I'm fixing the lack of right. It's like doing Tshuva Elo and skipping the step of Tshuva Tata. That's what you have to understand in Asham. A carbon ashram is a male sin offering. The logic to a male sin offering, beklalos, I'm not going into this, to the exceptional cases, but the, the significance of a male sin offering means is I'm not correcting the Aveda. I'm connecting my lack of connection to Hashem. And by correcting my lack of connection to Hashem, I'm, I'm skipping to the higher component, to the deeper component of tshuva. I'm renewing my bond with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's what an asham means. Okay, and there's five ashames. And last week we talked about two of them. We talked about asham gezelis. Asham gezelis means I'm bringing a carbon not for stealing. For stealing and swearing falsely. Swearing falsely about my theft. So I bring an Asham Gezeles, and Asham Gezeles is one of the few Karbanes, one of the few Karbanes that you bring for a mazid. You did it on purpose. You, you swore falsely with intent. You knew that it, you were lying and you swore falsely. And you bring a Karban Asham, you don't bring a Karban Chatas. And the logic was that Asham Gezeles means I lost my belief that God feeds me. I lost my belief that Panasa comes from Hashem, which is why I stole and I swore falsely. So the Asham is about regaining my belief in the fact that Panasa comes from Hashem. And then we learned Asham Me'ilis. Asham Me'ilis could be both for a mazid and a Shegig. And Asham Me'ilis means I stole money from Hektish. Or the way I explain this to you in very practical down-to-earth terms, I stole public money. The problem with public money is that nobody owns it. The problem with money that nobody owns is that nobody cares. So this is the, the this is the unique crime of stealing from God. This is the unique crime of stealing Lahavla. I'm not making comparisons, but there is a comparison when you steal from the government. Because nobody is gonna know. No one's gonna care. It's not mine. It's everybody's. It's nobody's. So Ashami Ilis is unique, is a unique carbon where I was moyo behektish, I abuse that belongs to Hektish, and I bring in a carbon. The only way for me to be honest about public money. The only way for me to be honest about money that belongs to Hashem and not to you or to him or to him 
which means I stolen money from a person, from an entity that no one's really going to care enough to collect. Unless like I really do a, a made off, you know, with a lot of money from the government, um, is by thinking about God. So for a me'ilah, for violating, for abusing public money, abusing like money belongs to hektish, you bring an asham. An asham, again, is a carbon that's not focused on the sin. It's a carbon focused on my connection to Hashem. So now, if you have your Mishnayis, and of course you all do, the bottom of page 23, I'm going to read it quickly inside. Zivchei Shal the laws of the offering of a communal carbon shlomim. We talked about this two weeks ago. I'm not talking about it again. Va'ashomis. And what Rabbi Angel Zagazunzan translates as a guilt offerings. There's five or six guilt offerings. Eloheina Ashamis. This is the list of guilt offerings. Number one, Asham Gezelis. A guilt offering for stealing and swearing falsely, because I forget that Panasa comes from Hashem. Number two, Asham Me'iles. A guilt offering for abusing public money, money of Hektish. That because it belongs to everybody and it belongs to nobody, no one's going to care. So I have to bring a carbon, which is not about the fact that I stole, but that I violated God. So I have to reconnect to Baruch Hu. And the third one is called Hashem Shivcha Charuf. Now how do you translate Hashem Shivcha Charuf in English? The guilt offering for violating a betrothed handmaiden. <laughs> Asham Shiv HaKarufa is the guilt offering for violating a betrothed handmaiden. I have no idea what a handmaiden is, but that's how we try and say it into English. Asham Shiv HaKarufa is a weird halacha. It's a very, very weird halacha. I've done a terrible Aveda, a terrible Aveda, but because of a technicality, it's not an Aveda at all. One of the worst Avedas in the Tehidah is Gilead Reis. Adultery is a terrible Aveda. If I live with a married woman, that been married to somebody else, it's a chiv misa. Why? It's a violation of unity, right? It's a violation of a violation of, 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 of oneness. It's like a vaydazara. Vaydazara means I'm married to God and I live with somebody else. I'm chayiv misa. When I live with somebody else's wife, it's a terrible aveda. Gilad is a terrible aveda. And as I explained to you in the Mishpatim classes, all three of vaydazara, Gilad Rais, the Shvich Hasdamim share this property. There's such a thing as private, and what's private is not mine. And when I violate somebody else's private, it's a terrible sin. A shivcha harufa is a married woman. <laughs> a married woman. A married woman should be chay of misa, but she don't get chay of misa. You know why? Because she hasn't finished her gerus. That's what Hashem Shem It's a weird case. It's a very, very weird case. I've done an Aveda, which really is gilar. It's just adultery. But there's no liability, there's no... No punishment for this act of adultery because she's not finished her gear. It's a weird kind of a concept. A Goya, a, non a non-Jewish woman, has no such thing as marriage with a Jew. Right? A Jew and a Jew have marriage. A Goya and a Jew have, a Goya and a Goya have marriage. In Allah has a Torah. A Yid and a non-Yid don't have concept of no such thing. There's no such thing as a marriage in a Yid and a non-Yid. Certainly from a Yid to a Goya. It's just the way it is. Oh, wait, wait. So, right. So, how were they married? Point well taken. Exactly. But there's such a thing called a shivcha. If a person has a goyish slave, a female goyish slave. Now, when you purchase a female goyish slave, I'm not going into the question of the morality of slavery. That's not the question. When you purchase a shiksa as a slave, <coughs> she, you, you title her in a mikvah. And you have to tie her the shame avdus. You have to push her into the water and say that I'm tie her for to be a shivcha. If she jumps into the water ahead of you and says I'm being tie her the shame gaitus, she's a full fledged Jew and she's free. It's one of the interesting halachas of, of, of when you purchase a non Jewish slave, you have to force to tie them in the mikveh and you have to stay. I'm tie them not that there should be a year, there should be a day of Evan. A non Jewish slave in a Jewish home is considered Jewish. They have to keep all mitzvahs of women. In other words, an Evet Kleini, a, a guy who was purchased as a slave, has to keep Shabbos, and he doesn't keep Shabbos, he says, Misa, Chayv Skila, has to keep kosher, has to keep many halachas. Um, there's two exceptions, two big exceptions. One exception is, a, a, a non-Jewish slave in a Jewish home is not mechoyiv in mitzvahs, shasei, shazman, grom. It's not mechoyiv in mitzvahs that men are mechoyiv. No, no mitzvah for tefillin, um, no mitzvah for sukkah, no mitzvah for lulav, no mitzvah for shoifah, technically, 
mitzvahs that are connected to time, he's potter, right? Of course, the Pesach say that it's different, whatever the particulars. I don't know offhand the particular halachas of what mitzvahs men are mechoyiv and what mitzvahs women are mechoyiv, but mitzvahs are say, shazman groma, mitzvahs are time bound, the evidence potter. So a goyish slave purchased by a yid is toiled in a mikvah l'shem geir, l'shem avdus, is a half Jew. So one area of pturi is not mechoyiv and mitzvahs that men are mechoyiv, mitzvahs connected to time. And the second is the laws of morality are very different. The laws of, 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 of Tznius are, are not like a Jew. The, the, the idea of the Bevkeda Nichle is a slave when it comes to matters of Tznius is in many ways even less Mahmud than a Goy. There's no Allah of Tznius. So a non-Jewish maidservant, he calls him here a, uh, a handmaiden. I don't know where that word comes from, what that word means. She's... She was toivul Hashem Geiros, so in some ways she's Jewish. But when it comes to Nyonim of Tznius, it comes to Nyonim of Arois, she has a din of a goy, okay? So, Lechoira, um, there could never be a case of Gili Arois, where you have Misa, right? If you, if, if you live with a goyish slave, there's no concept of marriage between a Jew and a non Jew, just nobody have Misa. But, what happens if a Jew gives her Kedushin and says to her, the moment of your gaitas. That if you're going to be freed by your master, and you're going to be a full-fledged Jew, I'm being kind to you from now. I'm making you my wife from now. But wait, there's one more detail. If this shifcha belongs to two people, and one of them frees her, so she's a chatzis shifcha of chatzis ben chayden. She's half free and half slave. So it's a really unusual case. It's a shifcha kneinitz, it's a non-Jewish slave, that does not have the dinam of Arayis like a Yid, but a man, a Jewish man, was Makadash and said that when you're going to get your freedom, you're going to be my wife. And one of her owners freed her, so she's, she's a half a wife. <laughs> half of her is married because she's free. Half of her is not married because she's a slave. And somebody else lives with her. I mean, true. <laughs> Isn't she the old slave? Ah. The, the, the Gemara says that. The Gemara speaks about that. You're not allowed to leave a person in that case because you're helping the, the person is stuck in Iraq in a hard place. You're helping his master. The, 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 the halacha says that it, there's a machlekes b'shamei b'zil or whatever the particulars are. But the halacha says that it's not. You're not allowed to leave a person in such a situation because the chazi ever the chazi ben chayden from all sides he's punished. So this person did an aveda. He lived with a married woman. Be, live with the married woman, of Misa. But he's getting off by a technicality. Right? He's the ultimate low life. You know the story with the Badichavir? A guy comes to the Badichavir and says, Rabbi, I made a mistake. What was your mistake? I was Magal Arais. I had a relationship with a person I shouldn't have a, a relationship with. So Badichavir says, Okay, people make mistakes, you know. He says, Rabbi, but you know, it wasn't such a big mistake. I told her to go to Mikvah. I made it away seven days. So the Badichavir says, for you, there's never forgiveness. You're never going to be forgiven. Wow. He says, Rebbe, but I did such a small Aveda. I said, I know, and you planned it for a week. <laughs> the Aveda was smaller. The actual, te the technical sin was smaller. But to spend a whole week planning to do an Aveda, a person has an urge, he has an urge. But planning for a week, it's a smaller Aveda, but it's unforgivable. Here's a person who's done a terrible Aveda and he's getting away with it by technicality. This is called Hashem Shiv Chacharuf. Marry your, your slaves so that you have more slaves? Whoa, 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 whoa. This is a Chatsi Shiv of Chatsi Ben Chayda, number one. She's been freed halfway. Right? Number two, that's only true by inevitability. You're not allowed to marry your slave. If you have a Jewish slave living in your house, Rabbi Moshe Shiv Chaknainis, the owner is the, the master is not allowed to live with her. It's 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 I mean, what Aveda is there? It's not an Isav Gilead Arois. But you understand, this person is living with a married woman, but because of a technicality, she's not married. He's getting away with it. So he brings an Asham. What does an Asham mean? I'm not bringing a carbon for the sin I did. I'm bringing a carbon, let's use plain English, I'm bringing a carbon for my hypocrisy. You understand? I did an Aveda, but that, my Aveda is not an Aveda. But for a person to calculate, to, to live with a married woman and to get away because of a technicality, the, the carbon, the atonement for that is not for what I did wrong. 
It's because I don't care about my relationship with Hashem. This is one of the oldest issues in the book. You know, there's a famous, famous Ramban, which is quoted in many Sfarim, where the Ramban talks about the idea of Jewish people being holy. Kedoshim Tihiyu. And one of the things that Ramban says about the law of Kedoshim Tihiyu is that it's possible for a person to never do a single event. To be in, in technical language, what you and I would call a Benyani from Tanya. And he's called a novel Berushus He's called abominable, disgusting, sick with the Tater's permission. If you know enough halacha and you cut every corner, you keep halacha just to the minimum, you can get away with so many things. So the law you're keeping, the law you're keeping, you haven't done a single sin, but you have no relationship with God. Your whole relationship with God is you don't want to get punished, you don't want to go to Gehenim, but the idea that there's a spirit of Yiddishkeit and the spirit of Yiddishkeit is you're supposed to have a connection to Hashem, you don't have it at all. So you can be a novel, Torah calls you disgusting, and it's Bishusa Torah, you have a hat there from hundred Rabbanim, you didn't do anything wrong. Asham Shif Chacharufu, which Tak is in Pashas Kedoshim, which speaks about novel Bishusa Torah, is in this category. A man is living with a married woman, he's getting away with it because of a technicality. The carbon you're bringing for that is not for the sin. You can't forgive for such a sin. <coughs> the carbon you're bringing for that is here is a human being who's completely religious and has no relationship with God. None. Because if you have a relationship with God, you don't just keep the law. You keep the spirit of the law. And the spirit of the law says, this is disgusting. This is abominable. This you understand what Hasham Shev Charufa means? The way I'm explaining it to you is, here is a person who's living with a married woman, but it's not considered Gil of Arez because of a technicality. So technically he did nothing wrong. Spiritually, he was a, a, one of the worst of in the whole Torah. So he brings a carbon about his relationship with Hashem, not about the sin. You know, I'll give you an example. I'll give you one minute, I'll let you talk. I'm going to give you an example. A woman makes a neder, or anybody makes a neder. A, a woman makes a neder. And the neder says, I'm not going to eat dates. Okay? Her husband finds out about the neder, and he's made for the neder. He breaks the neder. Because it's, it's, whatever it is called, B'nai Le'bena, and this, there's a series of categories of, of Nedarim that a man is allowed to break for his wife. He breaks her neder. She doesn't know it. And she eats dates. She eats dates after her brother, husband broke the neder, but she thought that she was violating a neder. Did she do an Aveda? Yeah. You understand? She, she said, I'm never going to eat dates. She swore, a neder, I'm not going to eat dates. Her husband broke, was made for the neder, Mekana Labo. After her husband's hafara, she broke the dates, but she didn't know that her husband was made for neder. So in her own mind, she did an Aveda. Halakhali, she didn't do an Aveda. Is she a sinner or not? Well, not. Technically, she's not a sinner. But to use English, she's a hypocrite. Spiritually, it's, it's a sin. Why? Because you violated your relationship with God. You didn't do anything wrong. But in your, you, violate, you show that you don't care about relationship with Hashem. This is what this Asham is about. I didn't do anything wrong. But what I did is a huge sin, even though it's not a sin at all. Because it's against God. Even if it's technically allowed, it's against God. So you bring a carbon Asham. Someone says this piece of That's it, it. So you did an Aveda. You bring a carbon Chatos. But you didn't sin against God. You, you didn't say, I don't care. Yes, yeah, she gets the malchus and he brings the carbon. Of course it's consensual, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, we're what I'm trying to show you is, I'm, I'm building up little tiny in Yonam and Yiddishkeit because they teach Hashkafa messages. Sometimes you didn't do anything wrong and eh. Uh, today, this is a lot. There's a lot of people who consider themselves from and they hide behind this attitude of you know, the mother says you're supposed to be... Be matted, to try to find leniency rather than strictness. And it's true, Koycha de Tede is He's supposed to look for the job of a Rav is to make kosher. I can make treif. But there's a spirit to the law. The spirit to the law is that we're pure. The spirit is that we're righteous, we're pious, have a relationship with God. If within the parameters of that spirit, you could help people go through their lives by making a hetty, you make a hetty. But if people lost that spirit, my whole attitude is that I want to get away with as much as I can get away with. I'm never orthodox, so I can't do this, 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 and this, and this. But every possible hat that I'm going to use, that's called a novel, but it's So it's not, you didn't sin, but you have no relationship with Hashem.
So it's a sin against God. That's how I'm interpreting Asham Shir Harufa. It's a guilt offering. You didn't do anything wrong. But what you did is disgusting. Feh. You understand? There's no khatas. It's an asham. It's a guilt offering for not caring about the spirit of Yiddishkeit as the Abisha gave it to us. Questions or comments? No questions, no, no comments. Asham Nazir. The next one. This is the fourth. We just did Asham Shev Garuf, Asham Nazir. What's a Nazir? Can't drink wine and keeps his hair long. And can't become Tamala Mesa. A Nazir is a person who decides he wants to be firmer than God made him to be. That's what a Nazir is. Halachically, no? right? But Shimshon Agiba was told before he was born they're supposed to be a Nazir, as was Shmuel. Except that in, in Shimshon Agiba's case, the Malach said it. In Shimshon in Shmuel, in every case, his mother said it. And of course, this big Shas and Halacha, how can you force someone to become a Nazir? How can you make it a Nazir? It doesn't even exist yet. But okay, we'll leave that for the scholars. A Nazir is a person who takes on himself a Kedusha of a Kain Godel. Not a regular Kain, a Kain Godel. A regular Koyin has to be Metamala Mason for the Shiva Kraven. A regular Koyin loses a father, a mother, a brother, a sister, a son, a daughter, or a wife. It's not optional. He must go to the Levaya. He must be a Koyin. He must become Tomei. If it's not one of the Shiva Kraven, he's not allowed. But a regular Koyin is Mukhuyu Metamala Mason for the Shiva Kraven. A Koyin God will ain't a Yeti Pesach Basin. Koyin God loses his wife. Doesn't step out of the house to go to the Levaya. Because a Koyin God becomes Tomei to nobody. A Nazir is a Yisrael, man or woman. A Nazir can be a woman. And by female Kayinim, the halachas of Tumah don't apply, they can find the male Kayinim. A human being who takes upon himself the Madrig of Dusha King God, he's not allowed to become Tomei, he's not allowed to go to the funeral of his own father or mother or brother or sister or son or daughter or spouse. Because he's in a, temporarily in an incredibly high state. That's Nazirus. So how do you look at such a person? A good guy or bad guy? It's not him. He chooses it. It's a neder. It depends what the motive is. That's a great answer. The Gemara speaks about it. He's connected to the infinite, though. The, it, it, he's both a good guy and a bad guy. Yeah. He's a good guy. The whole idea of a person taking on a Kedushi Yaseida. You know, we go to mikvah every day. Or we try to go to mikvah every day. Now, you, there's reasons to go to mikvah. The halachic reason to go to mikveh is Rahman al a person was very a keri. A person became Tomei. She has to go to mikveh. But a person doesn't become Tomei, has no khir to go to mikveh. We go to mikveh every day, not because of keri. We go to mikveh every day. It's called tara yaseda, to make yourself extra pure. To use the yeshivish terms, when a person is Tomei for nida, for example, they go to the mikveh, there's no need for kavona. You table the mikveh, you're kosher. But if you want to become taught for a higher level, like for Maise Shani, or for Trum and or for Kachim Kalim, or Kachim Kadashim, or Paras Chattas, those of you who learn in Pedic as I do, just finished today the Alokas of Paras Aduma, you know how impossibly unreasonable the Alokas of Trum and by Paras Aduma are, you have to table with Kavona. If you table without Kavona, you're not tired. You have to table with Kavona. So when you go to Mikvah in the morning, and you're not today a Keri, you're not going to Mikvah because of Tumah, you want to take an extra Tara. A Nazir is a human being who says that for 30 days I'm going to be as holy as a Kohen Gadol. And during those 30 days, basically, he doesn't go out into the world, doesn't work, he sits and studies, and, I mean, he's allowed to, but he doesn't. It's, it's, it's a human being temporarily taking upon himself an extra level of crime. I mean, the, I, I, I hate to say this, but Nazirus is an idea which in other religions has been stolen from us. And as always, it's, a, it's, a, it's adulterated, it's made extreme, and it's taken to uh, ways which are not consistent with Torah. But Nazirus is a, a regular Yid taking on a higher status of Tara and he basically lives in isolation for the duration of his Nazirus because he's taking on an extra Kedusha. Taking on an extra Kedusha is a wonderful thing. As this young man said correctly, if this person's Kavana is correct. The other side of that coin is that the Gemara says, it actually brings it in Chumash, people become, people make Nidorim as a rule when they're vulnerable. Right, Nedarim Syag Laprishas. The Gemara says the Mish, the Psukim in Chumish in Pashas Nasei of Saita is right before Nazir. Haroya Saita Bikalkula Yazir Atmanan. You see a woman who, because of abuse of alcohol, right, fell into Gilead. Rois Habi Yayin Yaseh. 
says, I'm gonna, I was, I, Bahashgoch HaPratis, I witnessed a Seita Bekulkula, and the source of her kilkul was yayin, was too much abuse of alcohol. So I'm one who, because I witnessed it, I'm gonna take a Pama Chumra, I'm not drinking wine for 30 days. And the logic is, if you saw it, that means Bahashgoch HaPratis, you have a similar vulnerability, you're also weak in this way, so you take upon yourself, and then they know that you're not gonna drink wine. So the other side of that coin is, on the one hand, the Nazir is an incredibly high level. He's taking on a temporary status of a Koyin Gozel. Mamish. Not of a regular kind of a Koyin Gozel. And there's even a Shail and Alocha. If you have a Mes Mitzvah, and you have a Nazir and a Koyin Gozel, who should be Metama first? A Mes Mitzvah, someone is, you find a dead person on the road, so the, all the Alochas of, of, of Kuna fall away. A Koyin has to stop and help a Mes Mitzvah. If it's only a Koyin Gozel, a Koyin Gozel helps help a Mes Mitzvah. If you have a Koyin Gozel and a Nazir, who comes first? Because they're... Their status of Tahara is the same, except that a Kohen Gadol is this way for life, and another is this way only for 30 days, and there's a Shaila, who should, come for, who should become Tommy first in that kind of a scenario. So on the one hand, another is a very holy person, and he's taken on a status of Kedusha for, for, for interim for a certain period of time, which, which, is, which is a sign of piety, of righteousness, of holiness. But the flip side of that is, the, first of all, don't be from it than God. God didn't say you shouldn't drink wine, so you should. And second of all, the source of people becoming a Nazir is often or always because they feel vulnerable. They're afraid they're going to fall in to the abuses of alcohol, so they make this Nedin Nazir to protect themselves, which means they have a vulnerability. So there's two ways to look at a Nazir. Another is a human being who on the one hand wants to be particularly holy, and on the other hand, a Nazir is a human being who's taking on a status of holiness because he has a vulnerability. What's an Asham Nazir? When a Nazir does Naziris, right? You take upon yourself, the Allah has stopped Nazir. If a person says, I hate Nazir, I'm going to be a Nazir. The Allah of Nazir, you've got to be careful what you say because by mistake you can become a Nazir. Although by, by uh, Nidarim, the Kavanas, you, you go by the Kavanas Alev, not Kavanas Aper. What you mean, your intention matters more than what you actually say. They both matter. But, the uh, person, I'm going to be a Nazir for 30 days. For 30 days, he can't cut his hair. For 30 days, he can't be Metama Lamesim. He can't encounter a dead body. And for 30 days, or any Toma, and for 30 days, he's not allowed to drink wine or products connected to wine. He can't eat grapes. <laughs> Even though grapes are not alcoholic, he's not allowed to eat grapes. He's not allowed to eat can any part of a grape. That's the halach. <laughs> He's not allowed to eat grapes, period. Anything connected like to wine, he's not allowed to have. You can ask me a better question. Can he drink vodka? Yeah, in sort of. I'm sure that Allah is yes, yeah. but I'm sure that Allah is no. The spirit of the law, the technicality of the law, in other words, if a, if a Nazir drank mashke, he would be like an Asham Shif Harufa. He's doing nothing wrong, but he's a hypocrite. <laughs> um, but in any case, when a Nazir completes his 30 day duration, he brings a chatos and a oila and a shlamim, with bread, with bread, with two types of bread. However, what happens if in the middle of the Nazirus, by mistake, the Nazir becomes Tomei? The Piyam is all of Meis Pesapisim. The Nazir is in a home, or in a hospital, he shouldn't be in a hospital, or in whatever it is, and someone dies. So there's something called Tumas Oihel. If you're under the same roof as a Tommy Mace, you become Tommy. So this Nazi became Tommy by mistake. He became Tommy by mistake. So think about what kind of human being you're dealing with. You're dealing with a Jew who has artificially taken on, Hashem didn't mandate it. He's artificially taken on, he's decided, I want to be as holy as a Koyan Gadol for 30 days, which makes him very, very righteous. But his desire to be as holy as a can God for 30 days is predicated on the fact that he feels vulnerable to falling into actual sin. So he's protecting himself, he's taking on a very high standard. Part of that standard is he's not allowed to become Tommy in the maze, I'm coming to unclean, to dead bodies. And he becomes Tommy by mistake. What did he do wrong? Nothing. It's an accident, it's not his fault. But that's the pism, it's oinus. Right? I mean, I've told you a hundred times, but chlaw for oinus, there's no heal. I've told you this a thousand times. Shoyig does not mean an accident. Shoyig means a lack of judgment. Oinus, a complete accident. The person who doesn't have a complete accident has no liability at all. None. You're only liable if you did something, you were speeding. 
and you killed somebody, that's a shaygig. But if you were traveling at regular speed, and someone got killed by a completely fluke accident, that's not a shaygig, that's an oinus. And for an oinus, there's no din of any miklat. And the girl is not allowed to kill you if he kills you, it's chayiv misa. So oinus is something that happens at my fault. If you become tome by oinus, you're tome. I didn't intend it, I wasn't planning it, it was a pessimism, a total surprise. So here's a person, that on the one hand is someone who's taken on some of the highest levels of Kedusha, on the other hand he's taken on this highest level of Kedusha because of his own personal vulnerability, and then he becomes Tommy. Now, if you become Tommy and it's a complete accident, whose fault is it? She becomes Tommy. By a complete accident. No, whose not. fault is it? It's God's fault. The Abishu was metame you. The Abishu could arrange Bashkacha Pratas that you should walk out one minute before that person dies. He didn't. So you became Tommy with Pesa Pisim. So you try to do such a righteous thing. You try to do such a wonderful thing. You took up by yourself because you just came God. And you're doing it because you want to protect yourself from your own weakness, your own vulnerability. And the Abish does metame you. You didn't do anything wrong. But you bring an usher. If you want to use words, God is sending you a message. When you take upon yourself to be extra frum, which is a very, very controversial issue. Taking on extra frumkite is a controversial. I want you to know that in the Hasidic tradition, in the, Chab- in the Hasidic tradition, the Chabad tradition for sure, other Hasidists I don't know so much, you probably are aware that one of the trademarks of Hasidim always was being extra frum. Hasidim always were mahada be mitzvahs, chos itself, and like it says in the understanding of Hasidus, item two. We ate only, you know, past Yisrael and only Bishel Yisrael. And we only ate glad kosher. In, in Europe, most people ate regular kosher. Shab, Pesach, you want to eat Shmuda Mishas Ketzira, Shmuda Mishas Ketzira. Chesidim were always traditionally Mahadeba Mitzvahs. But there was a rule that said that to take on a hidden mitzvah, you needed a Shus of a Rebbe. For example, we wash our hands three times when we do it until it's and we use a towel. This is a Mishagas, I know that's a bad word, that starts with the Rebbe Rashab. It probably has a source earlier, but I'm not sure. But Chesidim didn't do it. Right, halachically, if you're an Orthodox Jew and you wash the tail's time for bread, how many times do you have to wash each hand? Once. Once. One, one, it's enough. Washing twice is already a chumrah. Why are you washing twice? You wash your hands, stick of the tummah, and you wash it a second time to wash away the tummy water that it shouldn't roll down your arm and then roll back up your arm onto your hand and make your tummy again. Three times is a mishagas. The Rebbe Rashab did three times with a towel because Chas V'Shalom, the water of his hands will touch the water on the handle of the keli and the Mamitame his hands and then when he washes it again it's not going to become tired. Okay, it's based on Hagos Sashri. The Rebbe Rashab was asked once why he does it. He says, at the moment I forgot my source but if I'm doing it it has a source and they found it later. It says Nayim Yem. There's a source for it in Hagos Sashri from the Rosh to wash three times, not twice, not once. But when Chassidim would imitate him he'd get very upset. The Rebbe Rashab used to say, I don't like when people imitate me. And there's two stories. A simple, simple Jew, a simple Jew, knew nothing. He was in Lubavitch, and he watched the Rebbe Rashab wash. He took a towel, and he held the kvart. His right hand passed it to his left hand. One, two, three. Then he put it back with the towel into his right hand. One, two, three. And then fourth, what you're supposed to do, you're supposed to make a little cup. And they'll leave a little water in your hand. And as you're making the bracha, or after you make the bracha, you're supposed to be mishafshif. Because the bracha is supposed to come before the mitzvah. Bracha has always come before mitzvahs. The tilsi daim is one of the few exceptions where the bracha comes after the mitzvah. This is why after you make the bracha, or as you're making the bracha, you rub your hands together so that the tilsi daim comes able asayasa. First you make the bracha, and then you do the mitzvah. And the Rebbe Rashab watched this chassid imitate him. And he figured, if it's good for the Rebbe, it's good for me. So he took a towel, he grabbed it with his right hand, he handed it to the towel with his left hand, one, two, three, and the Rebbe Rashab didn't say a word to him. Another occasion, there was a big prominent chassid who saw the Rebbe Rashab wash his hands three times like he did with a towel. And the Rebbe Rashab said to him, Ver zokta do house by them. Who says you're on the level to do this? Ooh. So he told the Rebbe, but the Rebbe is doing it. And the Rebbe said, but the Rebbe, what I do is my business. You have to ask yourself if you're holding on that madreg. So someone said to the Rebbe, yeah, but last week you saw Shmerel, the janitor, do it. And you didn't say a word to him. He says, Shmerel, the janitor, is a simple Jew. He did what I did just because I did it. He wasn't thinking about any cheshboinus. But this is a big chassid. To take on a hidu mitzvah, you need rishus. 
In the olden days, if you want to take on extra chumrah, including Pas Yisro, glad kosher, you needed a shus marebet. That was the tradition. So we all do it today. We wait a bit of time. We wait a bit of time just from Bar Mitzvah. You know how unheard of that is? Rabbi Natan was warned by a big chassidim. You think every Lubavitcher has to water by time? Go back a hundred years? Are you nuts? We put him in time to Bar Mitzvah and even realize the Chiddush of Adava. The answer is because we're at such a low level. Whatever you can hop on, you do. Like the simple Jew who washed his head three times. We, the Rebbe says, today, whatever you can take on. And it doesn't mean everything. I, I have an issue with the people who decided that they can wear four pairs of tefillin, which the Rebbe said, Befeli, you need a goof, not give a But we have a different approach. But traditionally, if you want to take on Hidden Mitzvah, you need a picture from the Rebbe. I have a great story, which I want to share with you, and I will share with you. It's a wonderful story, and I read the story in a book. The story, there was a Yid by the name of Lazen Nanis. Lazen Nanis was one of those Jews who forgot to die. He went around twice. <laughs> he, he finished his, he lived 99 years. Now the secret to his longevity was that he sat in prison, in Soviet prison, Soviet Gulag, Siberia, for 20 years. And of course, living 20 years in Siberia is the school of Arich Yaman, right? <laughs> Anybody have said, no, of course not. You, you suffer like that, you die younger. He came to America. He came to America, he was probably in his late 60s. And the Rebbe told him that 20 years in Siberia don't count. So he only lived till 80. He lived 100 years, him and his wife together. Amazing. He, he was a broken man. I mean, the stories of, of his Siberian, a Jewish woman tried to starve him on Pesach. She threw away the matzah that his wife sent, and he almost died. And in his delirium, he remembers this go- woman, who was a communist, who threw away his matzah, standing over his bed on the last day of Pesach, spoon-feeding him boiled water with sugar, crying, because she realized that she killed him. Because she wanted to make him fry, you know, but it didn't work. And she soft called soft out of Yiddish hats. He lived till 99. I remember him. I didn't know him, and I could have known him, but I, I remember him. He used to come to the Rebbe. So Leza Nanas had the following story. He lived in the Chersonic colonies, which is a long story, not for now. In the city where he lived, there was a very prominent Rav who was an elderly man. And he was a very respected man, a big Tamat Chacham. And one Shabbos, the Nanis family was hosting a very, very special guest. He was then a young man. His name was Abitcha de Masmid, Yitzhak Levi Gorowitz. He was a legend. Abitcha de Masmid was killed by the Nazis. Killed by the Nazis, he was in his late 50s, maybe early 60s, okay? This happened 25 years before, so he was in his 30s. Each of the Masmid's frumkite was disgusting. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, he would check an egg and check an egg and check an egg and says, you eat it, I'm afraid. He was very frum. He was, the matzah that he ate on Pesach was burnt to charcoal. The shalaf was matzah bachlal. He was crazy frum. And the bitch of the Masmid had a, had, he took on, was always taking on new chumras. One of his latest chumras, he never ate in anybody's house. If he ate in your house, he had to go buy him a pot and table it and cash it. it. He didn't trust anybody's cashers. And he stayed in the homes of the nanases, which means that they were very alakhayidin. One of each of the masses of Mishra was he would not eat meat he never ate. Forget about it. He wouldn't even eat chicken unless the shaykhit came to the house and he checked the chalaf before the shechita. He, each of the masses, checked the chalaf after the shechita and then he would eat. So when he came to the Nanis household and Mrs. Nanis wanted him to eat in her home, so she brought a chicken, a live chicken, she brought the shaykhit to the house. And Yishat Masma checked the chalaf, the shaykh had shechted it in front of him, and he did the badika that you have to do to see that the, whatever it is, and then he shechted again, kosher. However, she took off the feathers, so nobody ate skin in that generation, um, and she salted it. She soaked it, she salted it, she salted it, she salted it again and again and again. She salted it, she cashed it, and she made him chicken that he was able to eat on chalas. They made a kugel. I mean, what we call today chal, was a kugel base. They put it into an oven, and whatever they had in the house went into the kugel. And the kugel was, was, I mean, people in those days, a whole week they starved, so Shabbos they ate. It was very rich. And she put schmaltz into the kugel. Where do you get schmaltz? Every chicken comes along with a little bit of schmaltz. You take it off and you melt it and you use it. Not like us who throw it in the garbage, except for Pesach, but they used to use the schmaltz. When she made the kugel, she forgot to make the kugel with each of the masmes schmaltz. She made the kugel with her own schmaltz, which is a thousand percent kosher, but each of the masmes wouldn't go near it. So each of the masmid after the whole day, late in the afternoon, Shabbos, he came home to eat the little bit that he would eat. And the local rabbi, who was probably twice his age, 
a senior Chabad Rav who came to visit him. And they were sitting together in Fabrengi. And the Bishop of Damascus ate whatever little bit he ate. She offered him kugel and he asked her, for my schmaltz. Did you make the kugel with my schmaltz? She says, no, I forgot. So he refused. So the Rav said, you know, I didn't have any kugel today. It's a minute yourself to eat kugel. Chassidim said that the Alter Rebbe said that eating kugel on Shabbos is a day. I say, the Rebbe once joked about it by Fabregen. I don't know if it's true or not. But it's an old Chassidim about Shabbos. You got to eat kugel. So she, he said, the Rav said to Mrs. Nanas, if it's Ichid Damas, not the kugel, I'll, I'll eat it. And he ate it. Apparently, Ichid Damas started feeling guilty about this. He was in his 30s. The Rav was much older than him. And the Rav is eating schmaltz from a chicken, which he didn't check the challah right before and after. In other words, he wasn't as nuts as the bitch of the masmid. So he was thinking to himself, maybe he's becoming too frum. So let's say six months later, Be'ashgoch HaPratis, Mamish, by divine hand, the following episode occurs. The Rebbe Rashab is somewhere, and he has no secretary. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bacher, my ultra Bacher, so they asked Leiz Ananas he should stand by the door for Yechidus to pe- move people in and out. It shouldn't, people shouldn't drag, waste the Rebbe's time. So Leiz Ananas is standing by the door of the Rebbe Rashab's room and he's, he's letting people into Yechidus, he's rushing them out. One of the people who goes into Yechidus is the same itch the Basmid. So Leiz Ananas decides to do something that's a terrible, terrible violation of privacy. He doesn't close the door. He wants to hear what great Aveda <coughs> that each of the Basmid has to confess to the Rebbe Rashab. He was a chosset god of Yoyzin. His Yiddish mind was not from this world. He wants to listen, which is terribly, it's, it's, a, it's a sin, a big sin. <laughs> the bitch walks into the Rebbe Rashab and he's standing behind the door, but the door is open. And the lazy nana starts to cry. Each of the Basmid, each of the Basmid starts to cry. And he tells the Rebbe Rashab the story that Leiz and Anas witnessed. That they each stayed in their home and he had a heed of mitzvah that he would not eat chicken unless he checked the challah before and after. And Mrs. Nanas made a kugel and she didn't put on his shmaltz so he refused it. And the Rav of the city who was much older and greater than he ate his kugel because he wasn't eating it. And each of the masmit is crying. And he says to the Rebbe Rashab, maybe I'm becoming too frum. And the Rebbe Rashab is laughing. And he's listening outside the door. And the Rebbe Rashab says, Nay, Nietzsche. Fadir is yed is No, Nietzsche. Don't feel bad that you're too from. You're on the level where you could take on these kind of chobras. It, it's, a, it's a very sweet story. But it tells you the tradition. The, you know, Chassidim, you say, Frum is a galach. Frum is a priest. Now, how does that reconcile with the fact that Hasidim were extra frum? The answer is the frum kaitan of Hasidim, quote, you had to hold by it. A Nazir is taking on a frum kite, which isn't his. He's a Yisrael. Man or woman. He's taking on him or herself, Kedushas Kray and Gadol. And Hashem made him tame. Hashem made him tame. By accident. By oinus. What's the message? To quote you, what's the message? Maybe your kavana was insincere. Maybe at some point of your nazidus you forgot what you were doing. So you bring a asham nazir. It's a carbon for becoming tome. By accident, by pesa pisay. And why are you bringing an asham nazir? Asham nazir. The only explanation that I can come up with is when you take on an extra hidden mitzvah and the Abishta tells you no thank you that's the Abishta's way of saying to you there's something wrong with your kavona there's nothing wrong with what you're doing what you're doing is wonderful in other words it's not a sin but the whole idea of an asha is a sin against God I'm supposed to be involved with Hashem if I am such a deeply religious person that I take upon myself hid the mitzvah that the Abish doesn't even require. I took upon myself Kedusha's Kain Godel. And the Abish that made me tell me Hashem is saying to me, I, I don't want to say Hashem is saying, no, thank you. Hashem is saying, you lapsed. The Kedusha, which is, which is a halachic criteria, but it also has a mental aspect. If Hashem allowed you to become Tomei, Hashem is telling you, you were not focused enough. So you bring a carbon which is about focus. Osham is what? 
a guilt offering that you bring to reconnect to Hashem. And that's the fourth Hashem, Hashem. We did two last week, Hashem Gazel, Hashem Ilis. We did two this week, Hashem Shifcha uh, Harufa and Hashem Nazir. You had a question? No? Anybody have a question? Okay, so we'll continue next week. Thank you for listening.